Everybody, can I get a confirmation from somebody online that you're able to hear us okay? Yes. I can't see you anymore, but. Uh, this is Frank at Oagesha. I can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody, and welcome. Um, we appreciate everybody coming. Um, and I will I, I will say, first of all, uh, does not appear that we have quorum in the room. It's not yet. It's going oh, to she's going to go get somebody. <laughs> I think we're probably still not going to have a forum unless it's a huge group. Uh, <laughs> um, but I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for for joining online, um, and thank you for all for for coming uh, for those who are here in the room. Um, what I'll do is, uh, as we've got uh, guests that are on their way downstairs, we'll we'll start working our way around to introduce folks who are in the room, so that everybody who's participating online knows who's here and and. Uh, can make sure that you're aware of everybody who's here in the room and then we'll get started with our uh, with our agenda. Um, I'm Laura Campbell with Michigan Farm Bureau. I serve as one of your uh, one of your co-chairs for the committee and I'll start around this way. I'm Brian Eggers with AKT Peerless Environmental Services. Jim Mellon, Water Use Assessment Unit Supervisor, Eagle Water Resources Division. Megan Napier, AKT Peerless. Jack Needham with the Aggregate Association. Joel Henry, Fish Becker. Valerie Shire, JV Services. That's here, Michigan Dave Hamilton, retired from Nature Conservancy. I'm Vina Pappas, Water Use Assessment Unit. Uh, Bert Hammond Tree, I'm with uh, Junko Solutions Department of Ice and Water. Jessica Sweet, Junko Solutions. Rachel Fractor, Consumers Energy. Megan Tinsley, Michigan Environmental Council. I'm Brian Burroughs with Trout Unlimited, representing the state. Okay. Thank you. All right. Oh, look at that. Perfect timing. <laughs> and just joining us, we're just doing introductions real quick, Young yeah, Suck. Okay. Yep. Uh, so that folks online can hear who's here. Yeah. Yep. All right. Young Suck Dell from Michigan State University. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And, and this you... is for those of you who don't know, uh, this is Jackpo Solutions first meeting with us as the new contractor for the contract to do the logistical administrative support for the council. So welcome. Good thank time. you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. All right, Jim, I, uh, you guys are able to capture the folks who are online participating, correct? So I don't need to go through the list of reading everybody's name. OK, we get, yep. OK. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so uh, calling it from the folks who are here in the room, we do not have quorum, so uh, we are not going to take official approval of the agenda or the minutes from February's meeting. However, in order to keep us on track, uh, I will ask if there's any suggestions or corrections that people would like to make so that we can make note of those and update the drafts. So that those drafts are available for people's review before uh, and and be posted before they become official. 
So does anybody have either comments that you want to want to make or edits that you need to make to February's draft minutes or anything that you need to add or amend for today's agenda? Laura, there were two corrections to the February draft minutes that came into sharing one. They sent in a correction and then also Mike Frederick had a correction. So those have been made. OK. Any additional edits or corrections? All right. Seeing none um, and just double checking for the agenda. Anything anybody needs to add for today's agenda? All right. So at this point, um, as uh, most of you know, who have who've been participating with these meetings before, we do two public comment periods. Uh, we have the first one that we ask to be related to agenda items, and then we'll do another one at the end in which folks can bring up anything uh, that hopefully is relevant, but not necessarily on today's agenda uh, that you can bring up. So for this time, what we're going to ask for is, is if anyone has any comments to make about agenda items for today. <clears throat> All right, seeing none, um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn it over to my colleague Brian, and he is going to take over for the next part of our agenda. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a slide that we'll spend a minute on real quick, hopefully um, that's kind of a little out of line with the agenda, but this is just a reminder that uh, uh, pretty much all council members are now at the point of needing to seek an official appointment and um, I'll send uh, an official letter on behalf of the council uh, tomorrow to identify the people that we know or have heard from that would like to be considered for reappointment and their organizations that they're representing. We've tried our best to <clears throat> keep tabs on who does not want to be and if they propose an alternative to them or just remain silent like I'm out, it's up to the appointer to figure out who replaces them. So I would just ask right now if um, if anybody has any updates about their positions that they would like to kind of give us that I can make sure the letter is as accurate as possible. This is Frank Itawagishik. Uh, I'm interested in reappointment. Okay. Thank you, Frank. And we've generally been assuming that's the case as the default. Um, hopefully that is true, but um, the letter will kind of, unless we have, have heard from somebody that they don't, will ask that. And so that will go out tomorrow, and then all of you, if you haven't, um, are also free to consider uh, also individually contacting the uh, the body that appoints your position. And you should certainly probably good practice is to send an email or a letter directly to them just saying, yes, you know, here's who I've been representing. Here's my, my history on the council. Or if your organization would like to do that, it's always a good practice to send that direct communication from you to the body that's appointing you. But we'll, we'll send one out from the council that tries to cover the bases. All right. <clears throat> we did a question back right here. So, did you send out a letter uh, sending <coughs> or to the? That's also going out. It, oh, it, that's, it's going out tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, because we wanted to send them out together. Okay. What was that letter? Just a, a fresh copy of our last year's final report, oh. but to all the new legislators. Well, okay. It, it will go to certain. Yeah, they're, they're all gonna, yeah, except for the governor, they're all going to be new. Yeah. Um, but it will go to leadership and we'll encourage right. them to distribute it to, to their members. Okay. All right, you can hit next slide. Sure. <clears throat> all right, so we're going to start out with the uh, committee reports. And the first one is the data committee, and, and uh, I'll take a lead on that. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time walking through what progress we've made on a couple of different issues. I'll be available to ask questions when we, when we end. 
Um, I'm going to try to be a, a bit thorough um, because we've had three meetings and we've covered a lot of ground and there's a couple of offshoots of things happening on different timelines. So uh, the high level summary is that we've had three meetings uh, since we last reported out. <clears throat> one was February 28th, one was March 9th, one was March 20th. The first meeting on February 28th was uh, our beginning discussion about say broadly data used to reclassify stream types um, and specifically also about the Prairie River. And that came about uh, initially because the DNR had contacted uh, our executive committee and said we would like Water Council involvement <clears throat> as we um, consider how many years of uh, additional water temperature data uh, they may contract to have collected. And the initial, the initial discussion was that they were looking for input on whether to do three years and plan for that all at once, or whether to do one year and then have everybody review the data and determine whether additional is necessary. <clears throat> um, before, before even an executive committee meeting, you know, where we talk about agendas and where things could should get sent um, into committees, they had gone back and said. Don't worry about it. We've decided to just do three years of water temperature data collection out of the gate. And um, we talked about it a little bit further. And we said, well, you know, this is very important. And um, from a water council perspective, uh, we saw value in making sure that we use this moment in time to really thoroughly discuss the, the data types, policies, standards, protocols, just universally for the, the purpose of reclassification and use it as a review period. So we went ahead and scheduled several meetings, and on the first one, that's what we dug in talking about. <clears throat> and it pretty quickly was identified that there, there probably will continue to have been two paths um, process-wise. One is trying to be responsive in the short term to get valuable feedback to the DNR on time for them to write RFPs and get contracts to have it executed timely this spring summer. And that that is a much shorter timeline, as you can imagine, with the administration of getting approvals, reviews, executing that. And the group did decide when talking about content that it would be great to have the data collected for all of June, all of July, all of August, all of September. Um, deeper discussion, it's probably usually July and all of August that, that are most important, but we want to have all of them. So they really, at this point, have very little time remaining to execute all the steps to get a selected contractor, have them have time to get into the field check sites and, and actually have data recorded by June and July. So keep that in mind that we, we sort of identified that we needed to most importantly, urgently be responsive to DNR, getting them the feedback to structure an RFP, scope of work. And, but then longer, there was a lot of other issues that we as a committee wanted to just spend time discussing more from that point of, it could be at any point in the future, any river that you could think about, let's take a more look at the policy data collection. So we began that at that meeting, um, good one in, in identifying all the different elements as you guys are all well familiar, some things can seem fairly simple as water temperature data, but once you start discussing it, you can break it into about 20 different critical topics. So um, I think we had managed to identify a lot of those topics. Started um, started right in resolving some of them and spent quite a bit of time on a few of the sub topics. And, and that was where we got to at that meeting. The next meeting was on a different topic altogether, sort of mixed it up. And on March 9th, we had a meeting that uh, Jim helped uh, pull together and coordinate. And you can help me if I, this should be better categorized. But uh, I would say we spent time talking about work um, on perennial versus non-perennial stream identification. And we also heard a presentation from uh, a variety of folks at different places within the state agency about uh, the efforts to clean up and make usable the, the newest round of LIDAR data for stream data set. And so that's a really valuable, very, very valuable effort that's going on. 
mostly those two topics, right? Yeah. 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 Did you cover it? Thank you. All right. So that brings us to the March 20th meeting. We uh, basically spent the entire time kind of diving deeper, um, seeing how much we could get through talking about water temperature, uh, air temperature, and a variety of subjects, which I can, God knows, I can let time being, I'll try not to go there right now. But we, we made it pretty far um, to the point where by the end of the meeting, <coughs> Jay Wesley, representing the DNR, um, said, hey, I think from this amount of discussion, I have a pretty good vision here of what the scope of work needs to be. Um, and indeed, we, we did have a lot of good discussion that added a lot of clarity. So he said, I'm going to take off and on my timeline and start very quickly doing a scope of work for this contract. And he said, I'll get back to all of you with a copy of that and solicit the feedback. Um, in front of us now is also to kind of continue having some meeting time to work through the remainder of the issues and to see if the committee can identify some clear consensus recommendations that we may feel we'd like to make to the departments, uh, in this case also the DNR, about the standard policies for data for repurposes or reprogram. So, I don't have those. The committee didn't get to that step yet, but I think we're identifying some, some guidelines that may be good to add. So for that purpose, we will continue meeting um, in the committee and work through that. And when and if we get a collection of those recommendations we'd like to make, we'll put it on an agenda for the, the whole council here. Try to do what we normally do, which is we'll have an informational presentation one month. Uh, make sure everybody asks all the questions, has a good understanding of it, and probably make a little call if you and ask if the full council wants to make those rec formal recommendations. Uh, but then on the short term, DNR can split off. Jay Wesley, I think it was on April 4th, he did provide a draft copy of um, his scope of work RFP for the committee to look at. And, and again, honoring his timeline. He really needed to just send it to all the um, all the email list of people who have participated in the past on the data committee and said, please just send me feedback directly. Um, well, they didn't say like individually. The group has received all of the feedback. Sent it on the road. But he's been really good about recording that for a while. He needed feedback by April 10th to execute his timeline. And, um, you know, through from my check yesterday of that email thread, there was good discussion on it. Um, several people, I think John Yellow just spent quite a bit of time trying to work on it, and uh, Buddy made some comments, and Rex Vaughn from the uh, Michigan Lakes and Streams Association made some, Ted Peenstra, uh, a few others. And those were largely, Those were largely characterized by um, questions about like the maps and the locations of where water temperature would be monitored throughout that that watershed management area. There was some discussions and modifications about the frequency of data checks and downloads in the field in case instruments are lost or something happens to them. There was discussion um, and Jay will be trying to work in some as much data committee involvement in the process as possible. Um, there are some prohibitions against making, I think, bids open and available to, to non-agency critical staff. But to the extent it's possible, uh, Jay will come back to the data committee. And, I mean, if somebody is on the data committee that may be bidding on it, we won't be including them um, in those discussions. But we'll have to look at that as much as possible. Uh, I think, let's see, there was the decision I mentioned to do it from June, July, August, September. It'll go for three years during those months. Um, decision was made to go, go ahead and do 30 minute intervals. That was some discussion about what the time interval is sufficient versus possible, practical. Um, I, the decision was made to go 30 minute intervals. Um, it looks like the decision was that the watershed management area for this effort would be broken to uh, five locations. 
and those are still going to be reviewed the exact places of those. There's discussions about whether you kind of systematically spread them out or whether you target them for areas that you think the river should use. Uh, and then I think the, the one kicker there was that just to be cautionary, there'll be an extra temperature logger located towards the downstream portion of the, the site just in case something happened with one. I think in our discussion, there's also going to be air temperature loggers deployed by each of the water temperature loggers. That's uh, still an open discussion as far as whether that should really be standard uh, in the future or not. And uh, the DNR was quite, quite, quite cooperative in, in recognizing that if they included it in this RFP, that it would give all of us a better chance with real data to determine for the future whether that's really necessary or not, and how valuable it actually is. So, and on the fish side of things, I believe Jay said that uh, at this point in time, that's not, the fish sampling won't be part of this RFP or contract that they do. They will do that themselves and they uh, will redo all of the sites that have been done between 2012 and 2015, and they'll do it next year. So they, they haven't committed nor I think feel necessary to redo three years of fish surveys because they do have good existing ones, but they will they will redo all of their fish surveys next year or this year. Let's see. Did you, I'm sorry, the fish sampling will be completed this year? This summer. And they typically usually will wait <laughs> at least until July, often August. And um, sometimes, I think uh, actually August and September are more common months for the DNR to do standardized uh, electrofishing than June or July. But I mean, you know, not quite sure exactly what the term. Brian, did, um, did Jay mention it, like any kind of contingency plan in terms of if we have a really weird weather year? this year, you know, if we get another 2012, if we get another, you know, 2019, that uh, how they'll kind of make that judgment call as to whether or not this is a good representative year to, to do that fish collection. That would be my only, that my primary concern, I guess, with only doing one year of fish collection is if it's weird, then that's all you got. Yeah. So this topic of how many years of any type of data collection is ideal is a universal one that we still have work to do in the committee to discuss fully. Um, trying to decide in my head how deep to try to go on this. But whenever you try to sample anything, right, <clears throat> that varies through time, you can pick one year and you might say, well, I'm not really sure if that year was representative of the long, say, 30 year period. You can pick three years and you feel a little bit better that you're not going to just get one land on one weird year, but you can also land on a three year period that's different than the long. And so whether it's the water temperature or the fish, I think we still have some discussion um, that we've queued up and identified about how you how you overcome that, whether it's number of samples or if there's uh, any way to try to compare something about the years that you did sample and having a way to compare that to that condition or metrics for the longer period just to get a sort of a calibration idea. We don't have that. That's not something we've completed those discussions, but they're on the list. Um, I will say fish, fish are prone, can be, fisheries data can be prone to that issue um, in some ways quite a bit. In, in other ways, it's a little bit better than water temperature data in that if you sample a fisheries, uh, a fish population, and they made notes of it in the previous data they collected, and you, you're looking at your brown trout and you see like a really sort of healthy or natural distribution of the age classes, that's a pretty good indicator if you're getting three, four, five year olds that it was cold for most of the whole duration for several years previously. So in some ways, the fisheries data is a little bit better than just, you know, direct measures of temp in one year. But certainly within rivers, you can have, you know, a section of water that is a more marginal temperature. And in a warm year, the fish may just not locate themselves in that small area. They may just be more abundant in a cold. And 
it so that there's some spatial issues, but I, that longer term is a good question regardless of the data type that it identifies and then needing to assess and figure out. Other members of the data committee present that have some other key things that I may have left out. I've tried to be thorough. Good. All right. Are there any detail, other questions, general or detailed? Because I do have all the topics listed out. Um, I do have another question. Please, go ahead. Um, and and this one you may not be able to answer because this is probably kind of more a J question and then maybe even Director Lott question. Um, but when the decision was postponed for reclassifying the Prairie River, at that time, Director Lott said. Once we have a contractor identified, we're going to hold meetings down in the watershed to help Kate and explain what's going on to the landowners. And I wanted to know if Jay has mentioned that's still the plan, or you know what their what their thoughts are on that. I'm trying to think through the log of anything I've read from Jay or our discussions, and I don't believe that's come up. Um, that hasn't been discussed, so I don't have any. Or different information. Okay. Sounds like a good approach. So, yeah, I mean, if I were to summarize, I would say I did not see or hear any hard, um, any serious or significant, like technical, just real clashes um, within the committee. I think in many ways the the additional work that they're contemplating um, may may go beyond what we ultimately think is kind of just the standard amount um, for a new site, um, and they were pretty comfortable in some regards doing it. So yeah, um, we have more work to do to kind of figure out how the, the just standard policies may may be improved through our recommendations, but I think. They appear to be on a pretty good um, track to get the data collected and collected well. All right. All right. And then if anybody does have more detailed questions, um, you can certainly direct them to Megan or I and we'll try to get them answered or you can feel free to communicate directly with Jay if it's really about the specific data collection. All right. Um, have you guys set a date for the next data committee meeting? No, tomorrow's a big water comp today. We'll be we'll be trying to line up massive or several smaller um, meeting schedulers and try to such pain, you know, obviously. So we're um, we'll probably try to do like at least three or four months get those on get those figured out. So it'll be coming soon. We can go back to the agenda. It looks like the next committee report up is models. Committee. All right. Well, as usual, we've been busy. And uh, the biggest thing that we did uh, recently is we had a meeting where we discussed the uh, comparison of the uh, the current HAPNAX rule and a uh, new one that we've been talking about for quite a while, the web squared methodology. And uh, I'm not going to have a big presentation on it now that we did have a big presentation at the two models committee meeting. Uh, we need to digest that as a committee where we come back together and talk about what, if any, recommendations we want to make on that. Once we have recommendations, we'll come back to the bill of council. But I do want to at least summarize some of the concepts of what we're looking at, so we're just here thinking about it. So we keyed in on, remember, in 2014, we had 30 different locations of wells that we looked at. And we were able to compare, okay, we've got the half max rule. What if we use, if we recalculated, um, uh, by using the, by identifying neighbors, using the FX rule, but recalculating uh, the depletions. We had looked at that in 2014. And then uh, last year, we started looking at uh, different things that uh, Zipper had done, where he, uh, he looked at what we did uh, and said, hey, this is really good, but I think I can come up with something better, which was great. So he looked at a number of different methodologies. He, uh, one of them would be called wet squared, which he thought, hey, this is a good fit. Gave all his justifications for why it's a good fit. But we want to see what does it look like if we use it here. So Lena's done a great job of, of 
working on that. So she went back to the 30 that we had. To, you know, first she looked at just the wells, but she expanded the analysis to say, okay, let's look at the, the home watershed management area that those wells are located in. Let's see if we apply that web squared versus the half max rule to all of those wells in those water management areas, what would the results look like? So then we were able to have a comparison of um, not only single well, 30 wells, but 30 water management areas with all of the wells in those water management areas as to what the results look like. So we've got those results. Um, I, I won't summarize them now, but we'll give you a table when we come back um, <clears throat> another meeting. But it gave us um, some really good things to think about, and we will uh, digest that and talk about it at our next meeting. And we also identified what uh, classification of streams were that were involved. We also looked at what is the zone based on the tool and the half max rule, what would the zone be if you um, use the uh, web squared. And actually, there's very little difference um, that way. There were differences in how much was completed, um, but um, didn't make that much difference as far as uh, actual zones. So again, we'll come back to that uh, once we've got some recommendations for you. The other thing that um, the full committee hasn't been working on, but I and sometimes other members have, is trying to follow up on where are we with the recommendations from 2020. And so the, the biggie is the Michigan Hydrologic Framework. And it looks like that is starting to move. I'm very hopeful that it's uh, starting to move. and. Um, uh, there was a meeting recently where DTMB was brought in to make sure that they, they're critical to be on, on board with this. That it's going to become uh, something that, that's real. It's got to be housed by DTMB. So, they, uh, so some discussion on that. And so um, they're looking at getting things written up and getting grants in place to make it happen. So I'm encouraged. I hope that it's going to move faster as opposed to slower. <laughs> I've got a uh, Brad Progress, the Information Management Division Director and Eagle, will schedule a follow-up meeting that I'll be at uh, Los Americans here. Administration Section Management Manager will be at the, some of the procurement powers that be in our Finance Division to learn about the hoop, various hoops we need to jump through for grant agreements. So that's coming up next week. Good. Well. Uh, so I, I'm very, very glad to see that move. Um, in our discussions of this, it became really clear that one of the other recommendations is the uh, Michigan Integrated Water Management Database. And it is so closely related to the database that's being developed for the Michigan Hydrologic Framework Cycle, like it, it makes sense to pull that in with it and to use that, um, the same people, the same process to start developing that Integrated Water Management Database. They're just very closely aligned. And as we looked at it, it made a lot of sense that there's it's, there's not competition or um, things that was, there's no downside to bring them together. In fact, there's the, the upside to bring them together is that it can move some things the department wants to do forward faster. So that what wants to be, what we need to do as far as the hydrologic framework uh, is consistent with what they want with what the department needs to do. And um, the department may be able to identify, hey, there's some things we'd like to get going now, and that it could become as part of development of the hydrologic framework and incorporating this along with it. And what it, the biggest thing that it does is make sure that there's absolutely 100% communication between the databases and that they're fully linked and that there's no possibilities that we're not going to have, that we might have misalignments or something. So, it looks like a, a win win on that. And so I think we'll be moving forward on that. So I thought that was good news as well to see, um, see that moving. Uh, other things, there's the um, uh, the 3D glacial mapping uh, using the um, transition probability geostatistical mapping. That's a mouthful. Uh, but that's something we've had some discussions on. It's something that looks actually quite promising. And we wanted to not only look at two counties with that, we wanted to be able to make a direct comparison with some of John Yelich's work in those uh, counties so that we can say, okay, Yelich has developed this, this is what we do with this methodology, how do they compare, how do they contrast, how compatible. Right? So um, getting to have discussions on those. So again, I'm not sure how long it's gonna take to move, but at least I was glad to hear discussion. But the one that we haven't heard discussion on yet is uh, compiling the key operative properties 
use of the tool. And uh, that was a relatively small project. So hopefully once it gets going, that will go pretty fast. So that's uh, where we're at with the models committee. We've got some outstanding things that we're waiting for information from either uh, Jim Mill or with uh, Anyway, but we'll have some more meetings on, on other topics as well as the. So, um, any questions on that? It was very general and vague, but uh, at least we're trying to give you a bit of an idea that things are moving, which is makes me happy. Dave, we talked about this briefly when you were uh, presenting and, and having the discussion with the models committee on the half max versus uh, web squared methodology for. for uh, calculating depletion for multiple watersheds. Can you talk a little bit about how, how and in what ways we're able to validate that we're getting a better representation of reality from using the web squared model than the half max rule? Yeah, the, um, the things we have are number one, we know we have an error built into half max rule. The fact that it doesn't recalculate, uh, so it's throwing away water that should have been depleted that doesn't recalculate to a portion of that water. So we know that we've got a built-in error. Currently. What we have with the web square is that they were deliberately building on our methodology and looking for something better. So they're, all of their documentation is showing why this is better and how well it works. Uh, the comparisons are made with, but they look at a number of different methods. So the web square is one of them, which kind of showed us that this is a better match on it. So we have these published papers, with a work group that um, has been dedicated on that. And so they were comparing web squared with other types of models um, to validate and show that this is a good methodology. And do those papers, do they do they go through and as they're looking at the different models and methodology for, for calculation, are, are, I mean, is there hydrologic data that, that, that they're comparing it to or is it, or what are they, how, how are they, are they making a determination that you say, okay, depletion from this well, you know, pulls this much from this watershed? How do we know that that actually did that? Yeah. So, I mean, what we have is models were created that are calibrated and that they're trying to give the best representation of these watersheds. So, we're then comparing web squared with these models. You don't have direct comparison with you know, the hydrologic data, but with the model, which is calibrated to hydrologic. And they're using which models were they comparing with with hunt or with no these are these are um, actually american models not, okay not, okay yes so they're not animal models. So, okay so it's one of the models that's kind of what i was driving at yeah, so, well, what okay. kind of models are you comparing yeah, it to what you know what because I, what are we getting back to that says that this represents reality instead of we made this up too but it sounds better yeah, <laughs> no, and I, that's a really good point I, and i think that you know, we're using analytical models in the tool because it allows us to make a very fast calculation. Yeah. Deliberately made it conservative built it for that reason. Um, well, we would like to, there's lots of reasons to hate the half max rule. <laughs> and we would like to come up with something better. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, but that would still be for the tool. Um, there's still a site specific review. You know, they could use the web spread or something that or better yet, they would use American models in um, uh, say specific review. And that's why the Michigan Hydrologic Framework is so important because that will facilitate the creation of rare models. So the first papers do go through kind of that step by step process. Is that was that published? Yeah. So he created the Moscow model. So right, it's a numerical model. And then he uses um, actual groundwater data to calibrate his numerical model. And then from there, he was able to make comparisons of each one of the apportionment models that Dave has been referring to. Okay. So it, it's kind of like, you know, there's a, an order of, of magnitude of removal, right? Like there's kind of a degree of separation there, but uh, ultimately it is a calibrated numerical model. Okay. That's a great question. And then are, are Zipper's papers available. I have so, so much stuff is behind a paywall. <laughs> I used to be able to get to that stuff, but now I can't. Sure. I, I had sent those out earlier if you don't have them. And so my, because I can get them up. And if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I would, I, I would like to, I would like to take a look at those. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Any other questions? questions online. Okay. Um, new topics I know is, you know, been quiet, maybe hibernating. Um, I still think do we have do we uh, I don't see either of our new topics. Yeah, that's there. It's, oh yeah, there we go. Ben, do you We're have still, new topics? Still hibernating. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Well at least we checked. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have Conservation and Efficiency Committee. You know, we don't have either in the room. Do you see Kelly or Emily? I do not. Is anybody who normally participates in the Conservation and Efficiency Committee um, have anything to add about whether there's been a meeting or progress? <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> Interesting. I know we met last week. Uh, uh, we had uh, a president and CEO from the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and uh, and he talked about the scorecard, uh, the state scorecard. So uh, talked about how he spent, uh, how their organization has been supporting uh, for each state. Uh, you know how how each state has been uh, supporting in terms of water efficiency effort, uh, which includes funding and the policy. So that was really interesting, uh, the presentation we listened to. Um, um, I think we're in the progress of uh, the, uh, the hiring to extension educator for uh, the 2020 recommendation. Um, I think that's about it, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot. I appreciate it. Now, this is right. Frank Hedelagish. I'll add to that uh, to that report. Sorry, Frank, you got to speak up a little bit. We can't hear you very well. Okay. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. I just would add to that uh, briefly that uh, uh, the committee's been looking at the possibility of of holding one of our meetings in the field. And one of the possibilities was to be at one of the tribal water facilities. Uh, and there was some discussion about whether or not that would uh, that we would do that as a committee or whether that would be something that we want the whole the whole council to do. And so I'm just putting it out there for people to to consider. There are several tribes that have uh, both, uh, you know, using groundwater and as also uh, water treatment and have a variety of different types of uh, of systems. And so we were wondering if that was something that that the council might want to consider. Uh, otherwise, the, I think the committee's planning on on doing one of its meetings that way. So I just thought I'd uh, I'd present that as part of the discussion today. Thanks, Frank. Um, I would say we're, we we have been open to ideas to to move this water council, the full water council meeting around the state, and you know I'm not solely responsible or authorized to say yes or no, but but if you have an idea for hosting something like that, that would be useful to the to the group, and especially if you had ideas about this specific location for the sort of the visit and a meeting facility you know close by that would be convenient for us to hold a water council meeting we would be very eager and enthusiastic to kind of get that information and then you know one of our next executive committee meetings will follow up with you and we'll try to figure out to just i leave it to you frank to, to figure out if there's a meeting location for a portion of the day the site and which time periods um, which ones of our future meetings you think that would work well for, and we're all ears and would be pretty enthusiastic to to follow through with you. And, and I guess too, I, I would add to that um, to think about uh, if you're gonna if you want to do a field visit, um, the length of time that you think you want to take with it, because we've also we've also gotten some proposals to do a field visit uh, with Todd Feenstra doing some uh, some stream monitoring and well monitoring, um, but the presentation that he's got for that, that field day would be a full day uh, event. And so we'll 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 want to schedule that sometime outside of a regular council meeting so that we've got the full day to do that. So uh, Frank, if you guys are if you guys are thinking about that and you you know and you think, hey, we could get this done in half a day or less, we could 
potentially combine it with a council meeting if it's something that you want to take the full day. Um, maybe think about an you know a date in between council meetings when uh, when you can have folks come. Yeah, well, what we were looking at is uh, initially the suggestion was for it to be a committee meeting. But in our discussion decided that maybe we should consider being a broader meeting. And uh, I, of course, living in Harbor Springs, uh, mentioned Harbor Springs in August, and there were a lot of people who thought they they thought that might be a nice trip to take, you know. Uh, so uh, Harbor Springs, Petoskey, uh, that we have several facilities here that the tribe runs, uh, and there are two hotels that we have that could potentially be lodging and or meeting space and we also have meeting space in in our tribal center and so those are those are possibilities uh there that's here in, in little traverse bay at petoskey harbor springs we also have other there's other tribal facilities in manistee and mount pleasant uh that would be uh potential uh locations depending on if there's other things in the area that we want to do. I would think that a tour of the tribal water facility could easily be done in half a day and uh, have the rest for the meeting. Uh, so that's that's just some thoughts for you to discuss at the, at the executive committee. Thanks. It's great. Um, and I actually think maybe we'll uh, get a hold of Todd too and have him think about how much flexibility he has in his field day and then we have some sites up, up north too so it could even be you know a full day with todd the day before stay at night have a meeting and see the the other part so we'll follow up with you frank thank you does sound pretty good thank you thank you all right laura and doug implementation committee you want to take lead so we had a meeting on March uh, 7th. We did go through, really spent a lot of time going through the 2020 recommendations. Um, kind of what what are the status of some of the, the items that are out there? I know Dave uh, touched on a lot of them as well as other committees. We just need to make sure all of them are in the pipeline and having some type of work or action being done. And I know Eagle is diligent on a lot of this. There's scope of works being developed. And, grants being proposed and things like that and so um i believe we want this spreadsheet i don't think it ever made it out i did make it out to the full council yeah it, it, okay. yep, it went out with the with a reminder yesterday so hopefully if you guys saw the email that came out yesterday that that spreadsheet was with it so if you are working on any of those tasks or have some insight as far as that if you could just let us know um we are now in 23 i know this was just kind of uh, we're just underway, but timeline uh, is not our friend on this. The money that is available does have a sunset, uh, so we need to make sure that we spend it and, and we get our task done. Uh, we also shifted that to the 2022 uh, recommendations, understanding that we have to get the report back out there to, to kind of get the, the support of the new legislature so that we can get some funding for those initiatives that, that we've asked for. Um, and then really the final thing was the governor's 2024 budget recommendations. She recommended uh, a $23.5 million for uh, groundwater resources. And we're not quite sure what that was, uh, but it does have a completion date of September 30th, 28th. So that was the recommendation, not really what, what the budget's going to be, but at least it showed that she's thinking there's going to be some big pot of money somewhere for some groundwater work i don't see him jim has some updates a couple slides that you can provide okay. so, Good. so all in all the implementation committee just wants to make sure that what was recommended and what was funded gets done so that is our task is to keep everyone in line with doing their job. That's it. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Anybody have any questions in the room or online for the implementation committee? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. Jim, if you forward us to the next slide <clears throat> or the next or the next. There you go. 
Um, this is just a brief discussion, and you guys can contribute in as well. But uh, we have asked um, to see if people have new topics or special topics that they'd like to have time on future agendas to cover, you know, in a meaningful, not abbreviated way. And um, we've received a few um, from just a couple of people. We are working on, on that list right now. Um, I'm pretty sure we will have several. Um, the ideas where it could brainstorm and some of them might be you know, short, some of them might be long, some of them might be best to have kind of dual presentations from different perspectives on the issues. So we've taken the ones that we've gotten so far and, and uh, Dave is kind of shepherding, working with the people who proposed that to kind of come up with a good ideal game plan and to leave people with plenty of time to prepare, uh, make presentations, assemble data. So we will be having some of those. <clears throat> but as a reminder, if you have, if you have ideas for things that should be covered in the agendas, again, it can be a new topic, it can be a, a, a tough topic, or it can just be, hey, there's background information that just keeps coming up over and over in meetings. And it, I can't remember the last time in four or five years, we actually went over that stuff. It, it can be anything. <clears throat> and we are glad to receive those from all members or any participant. Um, Really, at any time, and we will keep a list of those, and we'll try to figure out the best venues to have them, whether it's here, committees, um, it could be just the fodder to give batteries. <coughs> <coughs> um, so that's just it. It's a fairly simple reminder that we will have some coming up, but always feel free to shoot agenda ideas and, and presentation ideas. And David, if I if I remember from our conversation about it, you kind of with the one with the recommendations that you've got for presentations so far. So kind of going through some case studies, uh, site specific reviews, hydrologic studies. You wanted to start with those in committee for uh, for the folks who are going to be presenting, and then once the committees heard those, bring the bring those up to full council. Is that is yes. that still the plan? Yeah, that's the plan. So the idea is that rather than just have kind of a all sorts of things coming out. Let's figure out what are the big issues, make sure we understand from different perspectives what they are, and then come up with an organized way to present it to the, the council. Okay. Have you guys had any discussions on when uh, on when you might be doing those? Well, from Eagle's perspective, I'm still waiting to hear what specific files what they want to discuss or what and what other issues. They wanted to discuss, so I've got nothing to prepare for at this moment. When I hear, I will prepare. Yeah, so that, that's what we're waiting for right now. Tyler's going to give us a list of what he's interested in, and then we will schedule a committee meeting to go over those, have the full discussion of that, and figure out what's important to the council. Okay. And then I think I think Todd is on today. Todd, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. You are? All right. Um, I know you also, we, we also mentioned it earlier here today, and 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 you and you and I have been talking about it for a little while, doing doing a field day to, to kind of take a deeper dive into, uh, you know, seeing up close and personal stream monitoring, well monitoring, some of those other, some of those other things. I, for the for the folks who are here today, Todd did send me some dates that he's available, and we did talk about this being kind of a full day event, so it shouldn't necessarily be on a day when the when the council meets because we'll need the full day to to be able to do the field work. Um, is it helpful for folks to send out those prospective dates that Todd has sent that will work so that we can figure out one that you know at least the majority of folks are available for? Is that how we should handle that? Todd, are you okay with that? The list yep, that you sent um, me, if I send that out to the to the council and say, hey, let's pick one. Yep, I'm totally fine with that. Okay, perfect. I will do that then. Maybe we can do like doodle poll style and Brie, you and I can work together maybe to get that out to the uh, to the council. Sure. All right, thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Brian. Yeah. So uh, next up on our agenda is June Jules from Eagle Up to Indy. Yeah, thank you, Brian. So what I'll be covering you know, to begin with, talking a little bit about the fiscal year 2024 budget, talk about a monitoring plan, 
National Groundwater Management Network, Michigan Hydrologic Framework, update on depleted water management areas, program metrics, outreach activities, and then the groundwater data warehouse project. Teresa Seidel, the, our Division Director of Water Resources and Eagle Legislative Staff either are still over there or were over earlier at the House Budget Subcommittee hearing today. And they're also scheduled to make another presentation to the Senate Budget Subcommittee hearing on April 13th. Their presentations will include seeking support for the Eagle Groundwater Data Management System and also support for a groundwater proposal for change. So the next couple of slides provide some additional information about the Eagle Groundwater Data Management System. So some of the current groundwater data issues, what types of data are we talking about? PFAS and other analyte data, groundwater monitoring, well depth, well geology, data collected at brownfield or other contaminated sites, both the water quality sampling and well data. Currently, we don't have any central repository to store data. Everything is siloed in the various divisions of Eagle. And it's a mix of electronic and hard copy formats. You know, the data that we come in from external parties may come in an electronic format or it may come in in hard copy form. So it's presenting difficulties with analyzing, relating, storing, accessing that data and maintaining it over time. So to address that, we had a lean process improvement project to make some recommendations to create a groundwater data management system within Eagle. So what is that? New system that provides for common storage, analysis, and sharing of groundwater data across the Eagle and across the state. So where who will contribute data, data into the data management system? Eagle staff, regulated parties, consultants, other governmental agencies, and researchers. So what's in the scope? Electronic data deliverables or EDD. Location standards, so facility location, data point location, data entry standards, so trying to get some common data entry standards developed, as well as standardizing data entry templates and reports. So again, examples of the data, geology, both glacial bedrock, groundwater sampling data, stream and water flow data, and well data. So what's in it for you? Um, when the system is up and running, it's going to provide access to analytical data sets for all Eagle divisions. There'll be a public portal for external data, external user access, dashboards and reporting to monitor data over time, improved data for decision making, improved data quality. It's going to be designed with direct integration with geographic information system visualization of data, improve transparency and confidence in the state's groundwater data. Okay, next up, aqua bounty. So we did receive a monitoring, aqua bounty's monitoring plan from Ohio DNR um, late on March 31st. It's currently under review by my unit staff. Then we will write up our comments on that, send it up the review chain, so there'll be further internal discussions with an EGLE, and then EGLE's comments will be provided to Ohio DNR. Jim, should you refresh our memory as to what exactly that is? Yeah, sure. So Aqua Bounty is an aquaculture facility that is proposed for Pioneer, Ohio, which is just over the border. Unbelievable. Quite salmon for food production. So they've got it. Ohio DNR issued a permit for their east well field for a total of withdrawal rate of 5.25 million gallons per day. And their groundwater model is predicting that the extent of impact from that well field will extend well into the state of Michigan. 
roughly half the capture area lies within the uh, state of Michigan. And the treated, treated discharge will go be discharged to the east branch of the St. Joseph River, which is a tributary of the Maumee River and then out to Lake Erie Basin. Uh, what else? Um, should mention that there's been quite a bit of local interest. I went down there recently to make a presentation at the Hillsdale County Commissioner's meeting. There's been some local press coverage on that in Hillsdale. A number of private citizens are very, very aware and in contact. Any questions about that? What are, what's the nature of your concerns? Primarily, whether they're private wells or irrigation wells. There's some, there are some public water supply wells, but the wells are going to be impacted and to a lesser extent. <laughs> what discretion do we have? Well, um, because the well field itself is in the state of Ohio, my current understanding is that we don't have direct regulatory authority under Part 327. Because the consumptive use, the volume pump less the discharge volume, the consumptive use is less than 5 million gallons per day. Therefore, it's not subject to regional review under the Great Lakes Compact. So, yeah, officially yeah. none. <laughs> we do have, I should also mention that uh, we have a legislature appropriated funding to Eagle, and we're using, we have a joint funding agreement with the US Geological Survey, part of which is to develop for them to find, develop and refine a groundwater model for the Mission Dew Aquifer, which is the pumped aquifer. The Mission Dew Aquifer is a glacial aquifer. That underlies portions of Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana, that's the name. And as well, we part of that funding will be used to install additional monitor wells in the state of Michigan over and above. Aquabai is currently proposing to install their own monitor wells in the state of Michigan at three different locations in the state. And vertically nested monitor wells. So a deeper well set in the pump mission no aquifer with a shallower well if, if there's an overlying shallow aquifer. But in addition to those three locations, we want to have additional wells put in by USGS. Probably work with RRD Remediation Redevelopment Division at Eagle, their geological services section for the drilling. Can you name terms? And primarily collecting groundwater elevation data. This is Frank and Wagishik. I have a question, but not on this particular issue. This topic it was your, your previous one. And so when it's time, I'd like to ask that. Jim, can I make just a quick comment? Sean here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michigan Geologic Survey has a contract to correct the wells in uh, throughout the state in the well logic database. And for Hillsdale, just as a note, there's 4,700 wells that are there. 53% of them were not in the correct locations, and we've now corrected them. And there were approximately 6,000 wells that were already entered into the database. And of those, 84%, excuse me, 84% of the existing wells were there, and there was probably about 500 that were there that went to wrong locations. So the historical data that was entered on the old paper logs was not entered correctly, but then a large majority of the wells were not located correctly into the well logic database. They're now corrected. A few slides from now, I've got a couple figures from MGS that will provide updates. Yep. Um, their, well, their location verification and scanning. Yep. So, but, but, Frank, you had another question? Yeah. Uh, my, you, in the, uh, in the, the groundwater 
data management system that you're talking about. You mentioned PFAS. I read an article last week about uh, PFAS being uh, part of that proprietary mix that is used in fracking. And that caused me a great deal of concern when I see uh, wells that have been fracked that are in agricultural areas. And I just wonder if that's something that that uh, you may be tracking or maybe be, will become part of that system that you're looking at. Maybe you have information I don't, but I'm not aware of PFAS compounds being used in, in fracking. I think that's something that we should, I can talk to our uh, breaking pollutants section, and then uh, we can have them come back to uh, another meeting and provide an update. Yeah, I, I knew that when we tried to find out what they were using, uh, that it was uh, proprietary and they didn't have to tell us. And so we had no idea, but I did, like I said, I just read an article that said that, and I wasn't sure about, you never can trust what you read until you verify it here and there. And that's why I'm asking the question. Thank you. Well, that's, yeah. So I'll probably need to check with uh, both the uh, priority pollutant staff, but also probably all the dance and minerals division. Thank you. And Megan, you had a question too. I did, yeah. On the, the Pioneer um, proposal, that aquaculture facility, mm -hmm. a private citizen reached out to us on that as well and mentioned one of the concerns being high levels of nitrogen and ammonia in the discharge from the facility. So since that will kind of go into the Maumee, Michigan watershed, is that something Eagle will, will look at and comment on? There's a, the way Ohio is set up, that's actually an Ohio EPA that permits their discharge. So I think they've, I'm not sure on the current status of that application. Are you talking about their surface water discharge? Yeah. So that would be Ohio EPA under the NPDES permitting program. So that would be under their jurisdiction. Okay. And uh, it looks like Buddy's got a question too. Buddy, are you able to unmute or, or do you want me to read your question? Yeah, I can unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Go ahead, buddy. My question is, uh, I've been contacted by quite a few ag producers down in the Marshall area for the new economic development that's going on with the Ford plant. And there's approximately five to six large quantity wells down there that are going to be affected. Uh, hopefully, they'll, they'll ban them properly, which could result in five to seven thousand gallons a minute being put back into the watershed in that area. Were you aware of that, Jim? We had some early involvement with Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Um, most of the proposals I saw involved a direct surface water withdrawal from the Kalamazoo River for the plant. Now there would likely there would be groundwater withdrawals for construction dewatering, but that was some time ago. Well, what I'm talking about is there's already currently five to seven irrigation wells right there. Two of them do over 2,000 gallons a minute apiece that either need to be decommissioned or they use them for temporary, uh, temporary either dust control or whatever they're going to do. But I think we need to keep our eye on it and make sure that these withdrawals are either abandoned or if they're not being abandoned, if they're being used, if the registrations are being uh, transferred properly or re resubmitted, there's a whole list of problems that could come along with this. Thank you. Jim, is that something that you would be able to check into and, and maybe give us some information at our next meeting? Yeah. yeah. Jim, I can get you the well records oh, too. Sorry, buddy, I I I I talked over you for a minute there. Can I'm sorry, you get I that? Jim, I can get you the the well records too. Okay, that'll help. Um, it looks yep. like Sarah Pearson from our drink water division had a question. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, just just to add on with the Ford plant, Marshall. Last discussion we had was 
um, a significant portion of the water they would like to make up from uh, connecting to uh, City of Battle Creek. So I'm not so sure what's happening with the irrigation wells, but I know that they're looking at making up a lot of their water from Battle Creek. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Evangelia, looks like you had a had a question as well. Are you able to unmute? Oh yes. Uh, well, I was. My question was for Frank. I think I found the the report he was talking about regarding PFAS and fracking fluids. And so, uh, like you said, that was released somewhat recently. That for previously proprietary formulation, that uh, a bunch of Texas oil and gas wells were using uh, PFAS in their fracking fluids. So, uh, Frank, if you would ch check that link, maybe that's the one you were talking about. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that the link to the article. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no and problem. I think that that is the article I was referring to. Okay, great. Thank you. If you could forward that article to Jim. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so then moving on. Um, Really quickly, we Eagle did apply in January to become a new data provider to USGS's National Groundwater Monitoring Network. We're still waiting for to hear a decision on whether that grant application got accepted. So, enough about that. <laughs> Is there any reason it wouldn't be accepted? I would hope it would, but um, <laughs> we're competing with other states, so. Howard, you got any inside baseball on that? <laughs> no, yeah. I don't know what the uh, how the uh, how Michigan ranks among other some of the other. And I think it depends too on whether they received their full allocation. You know, they got to get their uh, allocation and then figure out how much they can put back out. You reminded them we're the cool kids, right? <laughs> like four out of five Great Lakes for us. Okay. So hopefully by the uh, June meeting, I'll have some more definite information to pass along. Um, if we do get the grant, then it wouldn't start until July. So. Okay. Uh, next up is an update of depleted water management areas as of the beginning of April. This is a this slide shows the locations of some of those depleted water management areas in red. And this is going to be hard for you to read, so I can we can forward the slides out to you for further details. But in the table, the water name of the water management area, name of the water body, the water management area number, stream classification. The index flow value in gallons per minute. How much, how many gallons per minute is available for completions? And then what is the current status, plus or minus gallons per minute? And for those, uh, for those logging in remotely, uh, and for those here who forgot to bring my glasses. Um, if you look at your email that you got yesterday, uh, the, those numbers are also in that email. Okay, moving on. So this, I'm going to turn it over to John and Evie from Michigan Geological Survey for the next two slides to give us an update on their progress for their triage project for the well data and well logic. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, as some of you may know, but uh, just for a quick recap, um, Michigan Geologic Survey approached the state about correcting the well logic database back in 2018 19. We received the grant to go ahead and initiate start doing it. And of course, at that time, there was approximately 560,000 wells in well logic at the time, and there was an estimated 700,000 plus in the historic scan logs. That would be all the paper records that were scanned from the 1950s until about 2006. And so we initiated that project back in 2018. We had about six or seven people working on it. COVID hit us, and when COVID hit, we went virtual. 
which allowed us to have more people working because we only had so many workstations here at the university that we could work on. So we increased our staff from around 10 to almost 30 staff that we had working on this at one time. So anyway, what, what you have in front of you right now, we prepare quarterly reports that we submit. Uh, it's called our triage project. We submit this to the state on to reference what we're getting done compared to the funding. During the last month that uh, we had looked at in well logic, 101,000 wells that we had actually assessed to see where they, where they were at. And so those particular wells were then corrected for quote unquote location. That's a location validation. And so to date, we've corrected 410,500 well locations and 39% of them were not correctly located in the well logic database. That's the, histor the historic electronic database. 39% were not located correctly. That's this figure four that you have. We have essentially 55 counties that we started working on, but that's it right there. Thank you, Jim, you've got the right one. 55 counties started and 12 of them are at 100%. And so we're looking at priority areas that are driven by the high capacity uh, well division and as well as the drinking water division, but also MPART where they need to have data so that we can start correcting the wells in the, the down gradient direction. So then if you go back to the other one, Jim, this is what we call digital input. These are the actual paper logs, scan logs. And those of you that have looked at these logs, they're not very readable. Uh, in fact, there's a fair number of them that are poorly written and they're poor copies, but, but we make the best attempt to try and put all the data off those sheets into the database. And so at this time, we have 306,000 that we've actually input into that. And there are a number of well drillers that are not putting their data directly into well logic. And since 2018, we have 9,200 paper logs that we are inputting ourselves right now and putting those into the system. So they're the new wells that are being input into the well logic database system. So the total number is about 350,000 logs. And of that, we now have 45 counties that we're actively working on, and we have about 22% of the digital or the scan logs input into it. Total number on the project, we have about 727,000 that are already either input or corrected, and that's out of 1.23 million estimated well logs that were in well logic as well as the scanned uh, data files. And so that represents about 59% of the projects now complete. We expect to be done in 2025. Great progress, John. Great progress. Dave so, has his hand up. Oh, e, John. E, Evie Majuri is the project manager on that. She's on the call, so hats off to her. John, it's really good to see this work done. It's, uh, it's, it's impressive with what you're uh, doing. I've got a question that, um, you know, when you get the, the uh, percent of error, it would be helpful if we had some idea of what the error was. Uh, for example, it was off by 100 feet, it was off by half a mile, was in another continent. I mean, how bad are these errors? And what I'm thinking of is I saw a report, I can't remember if it was either Ottawa or Allegan, or maybe both, where they took some of the data that you had and they did that kind of analysis to be able to say, uh, this, this percentage was off by so many feet and so on. And I found that very helpful to help understand just what the nature of the correction is. Is that something that could be done? So that is something that is done. Um, as you're, you know, we agree that that's definitely something we want to know. The average generally, you know, across all of these counties, generally it's going to be somewhere around 800 feet. That if they need to be corrected, they need to be corrected somewhere around there. Um, but it is highly variable. You know, there are some that are in the wrong section commonly, township, uh, we come across several that are in the wrong county. Uh, we've even had, you know, a handful or so that were just plopped right in the middle of Lake Michigan. So it can be really variable. You know, the on the other side of that spectrum, it's their next house over or something like that. But 800 is the average across all, you know, 700,000 of those. Um, that's interesting. Thank you. And yeah, no you, problem. You've done that interest to see that at some point, just... Um, the, the breakdown a little bit. I think that that's useful information. Did you want to see it by county, Dave? Yes, by county would be because some counties are worse than others. 
believe that. Okay. Brian. Okay. Well, that's definitely something we could put together. Okay. Thank you. I, I just had a general question. I don't really know if it's who it's for. Maybe it's for Jim. I don't know. Maybe it's for John. Um, going forward, we're spending a lot of effort to correct, make things precise. I heard a little mention that they're still since 2000, I guess 18, there's like another many thousands of paper copies. We have the systems in place now, requirement or database wise, so that we don't sort of have this build again with imprecisions. Is it sort of more forced and checked right away now when somebody logs one, or are we still set up to kind of accrue problems after this effort? I'll let somebody else answer that. I know John's been doing a lot of training with well drillers. Um, is that is that back up and running again since COVID? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. We have. Yeah, we just hit one in February in Grand Rapids, so. Nice. Doing training that way, but um, well, Sarah Pearson, if you're still on, Yep. Hi, uh, yeah, this is Sarah Pearson and Well Logic is in our um, control and that is definitely something that we are working towards improving the inputs of these and part of that will be a new iteration of Well Logic that will have greater controls and uh, greater um, or easier inputs for someone to be able to to get something in the right location and uh, we're strongly looking at it being a, a portion or a part of that groundwater data warehouse where but it will be probably a different uh, UI experience but uh, what we're looking at is improving the ability of drillers and others the health departments to look up the location and essentially use it like a google maps where you can zoom in and you can see the aerial and you can just click on it and it will auto populate your geographic information and uh, i think that's one way that we can help that we're also in the process of hiring a couple of data analysts for well logic to work on our day forward as well as correct uh, those locations that are not in the counties or not in the or out in Lake Michigan or might be in Canada. So we're we're supplementing and uh, we are moving forward with some other uh, measures to uh, help uh, keep the data uh, improve it as uh, when it goes in first off. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I'm, 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 I'm also a dinosaur learning new tricks all the time. But paper copies still scare me because, you know, now there's, you know, it is almost anybody can make an app for any phone. You're standing at the hole, you're drilling, you hit it, takes all the air of asking somebody to look up sections and townships. Yeah. And if you're not doing that now, you're just inviting. <laughs> thank you. Question. Exactly, and some of our our recommendations when the drillers are reaching out to us asking us for more paper is we're offering to go and sit down with them and walk them through using well logic to save them time and money and to save us time and money buddy i see your hand up yeah the one thing we have to remember and for those that haven't been on this committee is when the well records were first taken you did it by quarter section so all those that John are correcting, or a lot of them that were done by quarter section, GPS has not been required, I think, last 10 years, maybe 12 time flies. So anything in the last 10 or 12 years has a GPS coordinate on it. But anything before that, of those, you think 500 and some thousand, or how many or John said, probably 80% of them were never GPS coordinated. So uh, even on geologic terms, it was quite the feet to get it down to geography descriptions. I think there's 500 or 400 in well logics. Uh, so um, it's a work in progress. So in Sarah's defense, uh, 
Beagle does water uh, water construction does have control of well logic, but it's an animal right now that they're trying to get down to, to some sort of relative consistency. Thank you, buddy. Doug. So on uh, as a piggyback to that, that's a, a nice point. I mean, average of 800 feet, that does seem like a lot in today's standards, but the fact that they were just section line, if understanding that if it's in the middle of Lake Michigan, that's one thing, but if it is truly 500 feet off, how big of an impact is that gonna have when we run our tool versus five miles away? Um, you know, I mean, yeah, it could be just outside of a different watershed, but is this, I mean, it's great to have the data uh, updated, you know, the best we can. But does do we think this correction is going to have a big impact on how we currently operate? Yeah, potentially, it's a potentially very significant. Looking at the distance from the well to the nearest streams for the groundwater depletion models, but also for our compliance reviews when we're trying to match up the well logs to the registrations to the water use reporting data frequently that doesn't match up so it'll, it'll save our we have accurate well locations that's going to make yeah this job a lot easier so question uh dave blush yeah <clears throat> this is a question for either sarah or john my recollection is that the corrected data that um geologic survey flows back to eagle does not include setting a flag in the well logic database, allowing us to query um, well logic data that is available through the portal for only those wells that have been corrected. Is, is that still true? And could we get um, that changed so that going forward, for those of us who still do research in, in different parts of the state, we can know explicitly in the database whether the particular wells we're working with have or have not been corrected by geological survey. So I'll jump in on this one. Um, right now through WellLogic, there's not a good way for you to be able to filter that out through the, the open GIS database. However, through MGS, we recently put out an interactive dashboard where you can see visually uh, by an interactive map, whatever area you need to look, you just draw a polygon for whatever it is that you're trying to do, whatever area you can export by county or township or even section, whatever you need to do. Visually, you can see uh, that report out. Green is good, red is not. Um, yellow is something else where we, it may be correct, but we can't guarantee it because we haven't looked at it yet. But that's our interactive dashboard. You can download validated data directly from that. Now, because of data host limitations on our end, that's not going to be a complete data file. Then you'd have to take that and join it to uh, the WellLogic download and sort out the ones that are unvalidated. And, and where do we find this dashboard? Uh, I'll put a link in the chat uh, in just a minute here. Thanks. Thank no problem. Todd? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I, I wanted to, to make sure that we we're not missing out on some of this too is, is when we talk about data correction and you know, we're talking about geologic survey, verifying well logs, um, this is location only. This is not lithology verification. That's a big point, and we could kind of easily lose that in all this discussion and how we talk about it. That's all. Yeah, sure. the, the only difference to add to that, Todd, is that on the handwritten ones, we are at least making an, an attempt to interpret what the, was written onto the litholog of the old historic digital logs because we're inputting all of that data in. Yeah, and, and I get that, John, interpreting what was written down there and how they described it. My point was we're not actually we're not actually verifying the geology that was drilled for. We're not actually verifying the lithology. We're still trusting the written record on it. Well, well, that's true. I even have to trust geologists sometimes. <laughs> Being a geologist. Sorry, <laughs> trying to be funny here. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you guys. Um, Jim, back to you. Okay. Well, that's it. So if there are no other questions, I'll turn it back over. Any other questions to Jim and his team? Okay, hearing none. Uh, next up on our agenda is the schedule of our uh, meeting dates. Um, and these are the official meeting dates. It sounds like we uh, are uh, in line for uh, a couple of site visits yet this year, hopefully. Our next meeting will be on June 13th here at this point. Um, that will be my last meeting uh, as I'm going to be retiring off the board after that meeting after 10, 12 years, I guess now. So uh, the rest of the dates are on there. Any questions on that? The open comment period is about to be open now for uh, any relevant topic. Do we have anybody that would like to make a comment, public comment? Not a comment. I have a question though. What um, we did have, we talked about at the beginning that reclassification of a stream uh, down in the southeast of Michigan, where we ended up having a lot of people coming here. How, what's the pros, progress on that? That's, so for right now, uh, my understanding, it is uh, it is the DNR director's discretion of what to do with it at this point. And um, they have noted that they will not be making that change at this time. And they're going to wait to collect some more, uh, some more data to, to verify that the direction that their previous data indicated is indeed correct or it may show something different. So it's and the last, my understanding is that it is on hold, okay. um, waiting for the additional data collection. Yeah, we heard that we heard that uh, directly from uh, Acting Director Lott is that is that she's planning on delaying that decision until the full three years of temperature data has been has been collected. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, Frank, I think you're up next on the agenda. We have a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, you caught me off guard. Like to to <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Can several folks put in the chat? Thank you very much for all of your service and Water Use Advisory Council.